This video looks at the performance index within generalized predictive control. So the previous video outlined the basic components of a GPC control law, which is in essence the prediction structure and the performance index. And specifically, we looked at the input predictions and noted that we assume the inputs become fixed after n new steps. And this puts a particular structure into our degrees of freedom, which is the vector of future input values. We also noted that the performance index, which is the sum of squares of tracking errors and control errors, can be expressed in a compact form using vectors of predictions. So we could write the performance index something like this. What are we going to do in this video? Well, we've defined the predictions. We've now got a clear handle on the degrees of freedom within the predictions, which is the first n new values of the input. We've defined the performance index, and we've expressed the performance index neatly in terms of predictions. So everything up to here is what we've done so far. What we need to do now is put all this together and perform a minimization to find the optimum value of the degrees of freedom, which basically optimizes our performance index. The predictions then are given by something of this form and that was covered in chapter one. Now the performance index assuming simple weights is given by something like this. You'll see we've got the sum of tracking error squared and the sum of control increments. Now the error is given by a formula something like this E equals R minus Y. And <coughs> so if I put these together what you'll notice is the performance index takes this form r future minus y future transpose times r future minus y future plus lambda delta future, future transpose delta u future. So that's our j, and here is our prediction vectors. So those are the things that we've already know. Now we need to do a bit of an aside on the h matrix within the predictions. The predictions include a square matrix h. So there's your predictions, and you'll notice here's an H matrix multiplying delta U future. Now it's square at the moment because we've assumed a full set of future inputs. However, we know that the future inputs aren't like this one here, which shows a large number of different values. In fact, what we're going to do is get rid of all of the far future ones and set them to be zero. And what that does is it means we get a slightly different structure in our prediction matrices. I can rewrite this H, this H matrix, as H1, comma H2, where H1 multiplies the first n new values of the input, and H2 multiplies all these zeros. And so therefore, H delta V future can be written as H1 delta U future. And H1 clearly is tall and thin. However, in practice, and this is quite important, all right, we're just going to write H, not H1, because it's easier and we don't want to carry extra subscripts. And it's taken for granted that H is defined as having the relevant number of columns of H equivalent to the first NU samples. Let's substitute these predictions into J then and see what happens. So there's our prediction matrix, our prediction. There's our performance index, and what we're going to do is we're going to take this prediction here and just put it in here. Nothing more complicated than that. Of course, this looks a little bit messy, but you can see all I've done is I've written y future here and y future here. Nothing else. So I've expanded out the performance index in terms of my predictions. Now, I can multiply that out a bit more, and what you'll see is I've put in the top here bits that don't depend upon delta u future, and then I've got a bit here which depends on delta u future, and a bit down here which depends on delta u future. Now this is just algebra, so if this has gone too quick, just pause the video and do it in your own time, because I don't think you need me to do that for you. So that's what we've got here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to cross these top two terms because they do not depend on delta u future. And because I'm optimizing j with respect to delta u future, any terms which don't include delta u future will not affect the optimum. So I can now focus on optimizing this bit that's left.
And so this is what I want to do. Minimize over delta u future something given as h delta u future transpose h delta u future minus 2 h delta u future transposed all times this term here. And then I've also got at the end this term lambda delta future transpose delta u future. Now I can combine common terms and you'll see the combination is relatively simple. I've got h transpose h plus lambda. Now I should have put a lambda i in there. I do apologize. Plus lambda i. And that's the bit that's quadratic in my degrees of freedom. And then you've got a term here which is linear in the degrees of freedom. Now again, I've not stopped and gone through every step there because if you need to, you can pause the video and look at this algebra in your own time. We need to optimize this function j then with respect to the future control increments. And what can we, how do we do this? Well, we first we're going to note that the performance index is quadratic. And also, all the terms were sums of squares, so we know it's quadratic and it's positive, and therefore, it must have a unique minimum. That's a simple property that comes from maths. And the other thing we know <coughs> is this minimum must be characterized by the gradient being zero. So how do we find the gradient of this function? So just a quick reminder for those who don't know that. The gradient is defined like this. It's a vector, partial df dx1, partial df dx2, and so on down. Let's look then at the gradient of some simple functions as appear in this performance index. I'm going to define a vector a, a1 down to an, and a vector x, x1 down to xn, where x is my degrees of freedom. And I'm going to define a function, this is the key thing, f of x, which is linear in my degrees, degrees of freedom x. So I'm going to write it as x transposed a, and you see I've got x1, a1, x2, a2, all the way up to xn, an. The key thing is it's written like this. And now what I want to know is what's the grad of this f? Well, the grad is defined as partial df dx1, partial df dx2, and so on down. And you can see clearly that gives me a vector a1, a2, down to an, or in other words, a. So what you find, and this is the key, is that grad of a transposed x equals a. And that's a really useful formula which we're going to use. What happens then if our function is a quadratic? What if we had something like this, f of x equals x transposed capital S x? Well, again, it's fairly straightforward to show, so I'm not going to do it, that if you find the grad of this, you're going to get S x plus S transposed x, or S plus S transposed x. So that's, again, simple background maths, and these are results that we're going to use. Let's put all these observations together then and see what we've got. We know what optimization is. We want to minimize over delta u future, delta u future transpose times h transpose h plus lambda i times delta u future minus delta u future transposed times 2h transposed all into this vector at the end. Now, you'll notice what I've done here is I've said I'm going to assume that this matrix in here I'm going to call it S. The delta u future, I'll call it X. And this vector down here, I'm going to call it A. Now, why am I going to do that? Because we've just looked at the gradient of functions of a vector. And what we've said is if you have something X transposed A, then the grad is just A. And what do you notice we've got down here? You'll notice we've got an X transposed A term. And we've said, if you've got grad x transposed sx, you get s plus s transposed x. And what do you notice we've got here? We've got an x transposed sx term. So we can combine these results together in order to find the gradient of j with respect to the vector of future input increments. So let's do that. Just a reminder then of what we're trying to do. So we're basically going to get that our optimization is going to give us s plus s transposed x from this bit here and just a from this bit here. And so what do you notice? We get 2 h transposed h plus lambda i, the 2, because h transpose h plus lambda i is symmetric. And therefore, if we add it to the transpose, you just get two of them. And similarly, down here, you'll see we've just got 
the A term. So if I do the grad of J, this is the result. Now, what we also said was the optimum was given by grad of J equals zero. So if I set grad of J equal to zero, then you're going to get this. Two H transposed H plus lambda I into delta U future equals two H transposed into this vector over here. Now I can cancel the twos, clearly, keeps life simple, and then I can invert the H transpose H plus lambda I, which I've done here, and here is your optimum solution. Now what's interesting about this is the optimum trajectory, here it is, the optimum trajectory of future control increments depends, and you'll see it's linear in the future targets, linear in the past inputs and linear in the past outputs. So this predictive control law turns out to be a simple linear control law. Practical implementation. The first set of videos discuss the fact that the optimization is carried out at every sampling instant. That is, you're continually revisiting your early decisions and updating them. So even though the optimization sets out a viable long-term plan, it's given you a whole delta U future vector. Actually, we're only going to implement the first of these. That's key. And then we're going to update our choices. So the control law is defined from the first value of the optimum input trajectory. And the rest of this input trajectory is going to get thrown away because at the next sample, we're going to update our decisions. So how do we extract the first value then? Well, we're going to use a simple vector algebra again. If delta U future is given like this, delta UK all the way down to delta UK plus N minus 1, then the first value, delta UK, can be given by just multiplying delta U future by this matrix here, I comma 0 dot 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 comma 0. And I'm going to call that matrix E1 transposed. And therefore, your first control increment delta UK is written like this. And again, you'll see this is linear in the target, the past inputs, and the past outputs. And this is the summary. This particular bit in the yellow box down here is your GPC control law. So a summary. The GPC control law is determined by minimizing the performance index, that's J, with respect to the first NU future control increments, assuming the increments are zero beyond this point. As the performance index is quadratic, it has a unique minimum, and that minimum can be obtained using a gradient operator and setting the gradient to zero. The control law is given by the first value only of the future control trajectory, as this is the only control increment that will actually be implemented and all the other ones will be improved. The control law is linear in the measured values and the target, and it takes this form here. So your control law delta UK, the increment you're going to implement, is given by this known matrix here, which you can compute, multiplied by a vector of future targets, minus P times a vector of past inputs, minus Q times a vector of past outputs.